Hello everybody and very glad to see everybody that's joined us today and today we're going to talk about one of our most popular subjects um, and I know that we've run a few webinars on this but they're always so popular with everybody we always get a full house um, about sleep and this time I'm really pleased to introduce Dr Neil Stanley um, now you may be familiar with Neil as he is one of our top health experts and has been on some of our clinics with the um, sleep, I think it was with the sleep charity, wasn't it? It Neil? was, yes. Yeah. Yeah. So um, Neil is hugely um, well regarded and recognised within the sleep community and profession. And perhaps it would be a good idea if I ask you to tell us more about you, your background and, you know, why you're interested in sleep to start with. Well, thank you. I mean, it's a pleasure to be here. To be honest, um, my background is very simple. I've been involved in sleep research for the last 40 years, which means all I've ever done as an adult is watch other people fall asleep. Uh, I initially started work alongside the Royal Air Force at the Institute of Aviation Medicine in Farnborough, looking at things like air crew workload, jet lag, shift work, medicines you can take and safely fly, medicines you can take, get a good night's sleep and safely fly the next day. Uh, in the early 90s, I moved to the University of Surrey, where I created and ran the world's largest clinical trial sleep laboratory, so a 24-bed unit looking at the effects of medication on sleep. I've published 38 uh, scientific publications on all aspects of sleep, from couples and sleep, shift work, job stress, rumination, medicines and sleep, how to measure sleep in different environments, including up a mountain and at the South Pole. Um, and for really the last... Uh, 10 or so years, I've been an independent sleep expert, which basically means I travel, or I did before COVID, travel the world talking about the importance of sleep, because I suddenly realised that you can't change the world. You can't get everybody suddenly to sleep perfectly. That's never going to happen. You've got to change an individual. So by becoming freelance, I've given myself the opportunity to do whatever I can in whatever format I can to get the sleep message out there. So... Um, so yeah, so I say uh, sleep is my life, my passion. Behind me, uh, you will see 419 sleep books, which I have purchased since lockdown to add to my other <laughs> 2,000 sleep books that I have in my library. So it's all I do. If I'm not talking about it, I'm writing about it. If I'm not writing about it, I'm reading about it. If I'm not doing any of those, I'm probably doing it. Uh, it's, and it's one of those things, isn't it, that you can't actually physically grab well, no, I mean, this, this is the thing. I mean, sleep is a universal phenomenon. We all do it. Um, uh, but, you know, it, it's, I could, if I were to be in the room with you now with a loaded gun and I put it to your head, I could make you do anything except fall asleep. Uh, I couldn't, I, I can't, nobody can, so you can't force yourself to sleep. And that's one of the strange things about it. It's not within our, our gift and Kevin Morgan, professor of gerontology at uh, Loughborough, said in one of his books, you know, falling asleep is like falling in love. Um, if you if you chase too hard the object of your affections, then you'll chase them away. And he, he uses the lovely word that's fallen out of use now. He says you have to woo sleep, and I think that's a lovely idea. Um, yeah. But that that's the problem. We we still don't understand much about sleep. We don't understand, um, you know, the, the the doing of sleep, and yet we all do it every twenty four hours. And we can all there's the, the little ability to avoid it. Sleep is a biological necessity. It's as it's more important than food, and just slightly less important than water and and air. So, from an evolutionary point of view, it's the third most important thing we do. And and the lack of it completely turn your life upside down yeah i mean sleep is about uh, what scientists call homeostasis which just basically means balance oh. um and sleep has a function we're not quite certain why or how or why we have to do it for sort of eight hours a day sort of thing but sleep has a function which is basically to keep the machinery of the body and brain going um, and it's a bit like oil in the car if you don't put oil in your car your car's going to break 
You um, can't predict which bit is going to break, but it will certainly break at some point. And that's the same with sleep. Sleep affects all organs of the body. So if you don't get sleep, there are a number of different uh, you know, consequences of that both physically, you become more clumsy, more liable to accidents. Um, physiologically, if you have one poor night's sleep, the next day you'll be four times more likely to catch the common cold. In terms of well, co cognitive performance, your memory, your decision making, your problem solving are affected. And in terms of mood, the next day you're going to be more miserable, you're going to have more arguments with your partner, lack empathy, and be less likely to make up. So there's no aspect of, of life that isn't uh, affected by poor right. sleep. Or right. the other way of looking at it, which is the more positive way, is if you get a good night's sleep, things will be better. Uh whatever it is and whatever you mean by the word better <laughs> getting a good night's sleep means it's going to be better and i think the problem that we have in our society is we talk too much about the negatives of sleep rather than the positives and one of the reasons why people aren't sleeping now is because they worry about their sleep too uh -huh. much uh, and they don't see sleep as important Whereas for me, sleep is vitally important and it's a pleasure. There's no better feeling than waking up after a good night's sleep. Uh -huh. And yet we eat organically, we swallow vitamins, we do exercise, we go on holiday, we go to spas to feel good. And yet we neglect the thing that every 24 hours could make us feel great. And uh -huh. that's a surprise to me because I say we've got this negative if you don't sleep, these bad things will happen. And nobody's doing the opposite, saying if you do sleep, then life will be really much, much better. You'll be happier, you'll be healthier, you'll be a nicer person, you'll have more friends. Um, all of which are scientifically proven. It's just that yeah. the science doesn't communicate in that way. Yeah, but uh, that's, that's such a great way to, to view it as well. Yeah. And, and that's and that's why I say, I say I think people are going to bed scared that they'll die or go mad if they don't get a good night's sleep, yeah. rather than going to bed and, and looking forward to it. I I genuinely this might sound sad, but I genuinely from the moment I wake up in the morning can't wait to go back to bed. Um, you know, it, it's just you know what I want to do. It's a it's a you know, it's, a, it's, it's such a nice thing to do. It's, it's a yeah. lovely thing to do. And I know that if I have a bad night's sleep, I'll feel rubbish. Therefore, I'll try and get a good night's sleep. Because yeah. why do I want to have an argument with my partner? Um, yeah. Because I'm grumpy and miserable. Why would I want to do that? So um, a lot of things that people ascribe to life. Oh, it's, well, I don't know, even the one day of the week. Oh, it's Thursday. It's bright and sunny outside and i'm sat in here talking to you and you know i didn't win the euro millions on tuesday and um, you know all of those things that you ascribe to life being a bit rubbish are probably going to be linked to not getting a good night yeah. and, and Absolutely. you know you can you can eat a multivitamin tablet a day every day for the rest of your life and it will make you feel no different at all you get a good night's sleep tonight, you will feel better tomorrow, guaranteed. Mm, absolutely. So what we're going to chat about today specifically is looking at sleeping with long-term conditions. Now, and something that you just said to me earlier, which was really interesting, it, it's actually irrelevant in most, not all, but most aspects, what that long-term condition is. So everything that we're going to be talking about is actually relevant to all conditions and yeah. i was just going to say that we've got the questions that we've got coming up and i will go through as many as possible people do state their condition but actually it's irrelevant most of the time what that condition is yeah i mean it, it, you know we we define uh, and it, it's the way of western medicine that you get defined by your illness um the issue with sleep is of course it's universal 
Um, and so everybody sleeps, regardless of what illness they have. And the issues that you have with sleep are pretty fit. So in most conditions, there will be pain. In most conditions, there will be a degree of anxiety or depression. Um, in some conditions, there will be obstructive sleep apnea, where you stop breathing during the night. In other conditions, there will be restless leg syndrome um, and you know, nocturia, getting up to pee during the night. So those, those are basically five areas. Um, and so in, in, when we talk about sleep, we're not talking about sleep in a cancer patient or sleep in a, in a you know, cardiovascular disease patient or sleep in an MS patient. We're talking about sleep. What can go wrong with sleep and how can you fix it? Because a lot of the time the illness is you know, causing symptoms. Very, very few illnesses directly affect sleep in and of themselves. The only one really that does that is fibromyalgia, because in fibromyalgia there is a, 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 a strange mix of brain waves during the night uh, where the, the brain does not get the refreshment from sleep, even though the patient seems to be asleep for a long time they don't get the refreshment so they seem to sleep well but they wake up and they're exhausted during the day and they're sleepy during the day and so that is a part that doesn't happen in all fibromyalgia patients but that's the only one where there is an actual sort of brain situation that affects sleep and sleep is of the brain sleep is generated by the brain and it's for the brain so that is the thing everything else is a symptom that affects sleep and we as I say we went through the five to start with and that's what you need to remember and then there's another one which um probably most of the people listening have not considered and it probably for many of them is the actual cause of the problem and that's medication because a third, I mean, if you get the British National Formula, uh, a third of the drugs in the BNF will list insomnia as a side effect. Uh, so it may be that if you're given a drug for whatever condition you're suffering from, uh, that, that drug may be good for that condition, but actually will be poor for your sleep. Um, and unless you tell the doctor about that, then the doctor's not going to do anything about it um, because he thinks he's treating the primary target. And the issue then becomes the more, the more um, consultants you see, the more drugs you're on, the more likely that they may be affecting sleep. And nobody steps back and says, hang on, you know, you've got three uppers and two downers. Uh. <laughs> you know, so what's the consequence of that? So one of the things to say uh, is if you are on multiple medications, then get a medicines review um, specifically regarding sleep. Now, it may be in your condition, you've only got one choice of drug and yeah. you know the benefits for the condition far outweigh any negative effect on sleep, but for many, uh, conditions there are alternatives which will be more respectful of sleep but you have to push for this you have to be your own advocate you can't expect the doctors to be thinking about your sleep because most gps in the uk have had no more than one hour and 26 minutes training in sleep in their entire wow. medical career gosh so, you know, and you know, if you talk to a pain specialist, they'll say that doctors only get 13 hours talking about pain, and that's not enough. But one hour and 26 minutes is the average in the seven years training. So, doctors aren't that well clued up on sleep, and this is why I spend most of my le time lecturing to doctors. I mean, last oh. year. I did 170 lectures to GPs around the country on the importance of sleep. And if, if, 
if there was no need for me to be doing that, I wouldn't be doing it, if you see what I mean, the fact that yeah. I am. And that's amazing, is it? Because you think, you know, many of the people that we speak to will say, many of our members will say, you know, when I get tired, that's when my condition gets worse and all of those things. And so it's like, if I could sleep better, then my condition would be better. So it's a, you know, and I think a lot of the questions that we've had through, but funny enough, we've had a number from people with fibromyalgia and also this question about how many, how much medication they'll take. So we can, we'll go through some of those, but I think that a lot of these will be naturally answered yeah. as we go through. I mean, to give you an illustration, I mean, certainly in the, in the idea of pain, um, you will get people in chronic pain who will say, if only I could get a good night's sleep, I could deal with my pain. Uh, the problem is they're a pain patient with the pain team in the hospital. And the pain team there want to reduce your pain score. That's what the pain team are there for. Yeah. If they reduce your pain score by 50%, woohoo, great, super, aren't I a genius? Yes, you are. But I still can't deal with my pain because I'm not sleeping well. Yeah. And this is the issue. If you go to your doctor and say, you know, I've got MS and I'm not sleeping well, the doctor will probably look at you thinking, they might not verbalize it, but they're probably thinking, you've got MS. <laughs> you know, it's like, yeah, you know, that, that's what they're thinking. They're thinking, of course, you're not going to be sleeping well mm. because you have MS. Therefore, there's no point in addressing the sleep issue because MS is the important thing here. Uh, and, and so there's this confusion between treating the issue and improving quality of life. And sleep is very much part of quality of life. Mm. So patients are reluctant to take too many medications, but the reluctancy is also based on the fact that they actually don't know why they're being given these medications. Yeah. So now doctors are so scared of using sleeping tablets, traditional sleeping tablets, that they'll use other drugs like antidepressants to help you sleep. The yeah. first thing a patient says is, I'm not depressed. So why are you giving me an antidepressant? Yeah. Oh, because we can't give you sleeping tablets. Well, why can't you give sleeping tablets? If I'm in a wheelchair, uh, you know, with MS, why can't, oh, you'll become addicted. Is that really the biggest problem in my life, that I may become dependent on these drugs? I had a 94-year-old ring me up on a, on a, a phone-in who said, you know, every time they, he takes Zolpidem, he sleeps really well. But the doctor will only give him one week's supply for two weeks because of addiction. He's 94. Do you think addiction is, you know, so he's having a worse quality of life because of his doctor's, um, you know, prejudices, not because of anything to do with the tablets, but to do with the doctor's view of the tablets. So this, I mean, I get in real trouble with doctors when I say this, but you have to go into your doctor's surgery or to your consultant and stamp your feet. Yeah. It's your life, it's your health, it's not their health. I don't care what they think about the medication. If you have a drug that works, you should never be denied a drug. You know, if you, if you went to a doctor and you were in chronic pain and they gave you one week supply of medication um, for every two weeks, you would sue your doctor for negligence. But you can do that with sleeping tablets. Sleeping tablets aren't ideal, but if they help you sleep, why don't you get sleeping tablets no. every single night? Um, if they work for you, if they don't work for you, then that's an issue. But that's, you know, you, so you really do need to shout and scream at your doctor to take your sleep yeah. seriously because they won't think about it. <laughs> and um, and that's, that's the problem, that you have to be your best advocate. I was talking to some secondary breast cancer patients and uh, in Middlesbrough um, and one of them said in the 11 years that she'd been seeing her oncologist he'd never asked her about her sleep and yet in that hospital 
just down the corridor is one of the leading sleep labs in Britain. And yet, you know, that even, <laughs> even down that yeah. corridor, the idea hadn't, um, hadn't sort of uh, permeated. So don't expect your doctors to be doing your best for sleep. That's something you have to ask, what we have to demand. And the tip is, don't talk about your sleep. <laughs> right. because if you go to your doctor and says oh, i only get six hours sleep the doctor will go well i only get six hours sleep so what <laughs> you know uh, talk about your daytime uh, functioning in the sleep field we don't talk about how long did it sleep or how do you you know how do you fall asleep or anything like that. we talk about daytime functioning so if you feel awake and alert during the day then you've had enough sleep if you feel sleepy during the day meaning that you could lie down on the floor and sleep then you haven't had enough sleep. So oh. don't say I'm not getting eight hours sleep because the doctor will go, don't care. If you say it is affecting my quality of life, my ability to drive, my relationships at home and at work, talk about that. Um, talk about how it is stopping you from living oh. your life. That is more powerful for a doctor than saying I don't sleep. Well, what does I, what, I, what does I don't sleep mean? Uh, you know, quantify it and then uh, you get into semantics and you, you're going to lose an argument but if you say look i can't do this i can't do that i'm becoming forgetful i you know that's where you can you can get doctors to listen to you yeah. that is also interesting i mean one of the things i think is re really interesting that you've said a, a bit earlier on which is really important is this business of actually getting someone to check all your medication because of the contrary of things because they just don't do that enough which is one of the problems that people get on with all the opioid issues yeah and, and this is this is this is absolutely clear you know as say i i had a a, a patient a 78 year old patient who was complaining of sleepy during the day being sleepy during the day and so the doctor said right that means you're not sleeping very well and so he gave him the thiopin which is known as an antidepressant and it's also known to cause daytime sedation so the patient took this and was still sedated during the day. So he went back to the doctor and the doctor gave him, said, oh, we still must not be sleeping very well and gave him tamazepam, which also causes daytime sedation. And this 78-year-old guy said, and I'm still sleepy during the day. You know, so he's been given two drugs that have been totally, actually, have created the condition he was complaining about. Uh. Um, and and as I say, if you look at the drugs that cause uh, insomnia, many of the antidepressants, uh, ACE inhibitors, beta blockers, opioids, tramadol, um, you, you know, the, you know, most medications for, for, you know, things like cancer, um, you know, all of these, you know, certainly as I say, the first ones I mentioned were routinely used in the clinic. So if you have a problem with your sleep and your doctor gives you an, an SSRI antidepressant like Prozac, Prozac causes poor sleep in 26% of people who take it. Oh my God, that's just so counterintuitive, isn't it? Yeah, but they don't, because doctors, well, I told you how little doctors know about sleep. Mm. They know very little more about medication. Mm. Um, and as I say, they will be looking at, um, you know, treating your primary complaint, not treating you as a whole person. Uh, so as I say, if you've got pain, they will give you opioids. Opioids destroy the bit of sleep that is actually vital for you to cope and uh, experience pain, the deep sleep that we have. So actually by wiping out deep sleep, it makes you experience more pain. Uh, now, okay, it reduces it slightly, and then it causes you to feel more pain. Uh, so, you know, so if, you, if you've got pain, you need to look at medications that are beneficial for sleep, uh, as well as being good for pain, or looking at two drugs, one which is, you know, laser focused on the pain, and another one that is beneficial for sleep, if that's what you need to have. Um, so this is the problem, going to your doctor and saying, I can't sleep. To be honest, most of the time, you might as well go and talk to your milkman. 
because at least the milkman knows what you're talking about. And it's hard to find milkman, isn't it? Well, yeah, absolutely. But it's, always, it's, much, it's much easier to find a milkman than it is to find a doctor who is actually expert in sleep. I tell yeah. you that. So just very quickly, because I, I can't believe how long we've already been talking, which has been fascinating, because we've got little, um, we decided how we'd theoretically go through what we're going to talk about. So if we just whiz through those points, then we can come on to all the questions that are coming yeah. in and that we have. So very quickly, what what is sleep? Well, sleep is, 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 is a mystery. So there we are, that's good. Uh, if I could tell <laughs> you what sleep is, I wouldn't be talking to you. I'd be polishing my Nobel Prize. Um, Sleep, very simply, there, there are two states of being during the night. There's non-rapid eye movement sleep and there's rapid eye movement sleep. You all know rapid eye movement sleep because it's when we have dreaming sleep. That makes up about 25% of the night. And non-rapid eye movement sleep is further uh, divided into three stages of sleep. Stage one, which is a transition from awake to asleep, which is maybe 1% to 3% of the night. Stage two, which is 50% of the night, and we have no idea what it does, uh, which is strange. But then we have this deep, slow wave sleep, uh, the N3 sleep. Now, slow wave sleep is the bit of sleep that is vitally important. So it's the bit that lays down memory, that does learning, that optimizes the immune system. It's also the only time that you physically grow. So deep sleep uh, is implicated potentially in, in, in dementia and Alzheimer's. Uh, deep sleep is the thing that goes slightly wrong in some fibromyalgia patients. Deep yeah. sleep is the bit that modulates your pain perception. Um, so that's what sleep is. And, and essentially, everything with the brain sleeps. Uh, our sleep is very much uh, the same as it's always been. Um, and that, that's really it. Um, so uh, it's about balance. You say it's about keeping the system going um and but particularly the brain the brain is, is is uniquely sensitive to poor sleep and that's where you're liable to see you know any effects that there may be mm, okay and i was going to say why is sleep important but i think that you've actually we've probably covered why it's so important <laughs> really <laughs> yeah as i say it just you will die of lack of sleep four times quicker than you would die from total lack of food and only just slightly later than you'd die from lack of water. That's how, from an evolutionary point of view, sleep is important. Mm. You will die very quickly without sleep. Um, so, it, it, you know, we, we, we still don't know exactly what it does, <laughs> but we know that if you don't do it, it is a problem. Mm. Um, and, you know, repeated poor sleep is not good for you. Mm. Again, it's, you know, it, it's associated with many, many illnesses. That doesn't mm. mean that it causes, but it just means the system, you know, if you, if you have a Rolex watch and you keep it wound, it will work forever. If you put it in a drawer for 10 years, don't expect it necessarily to work mm. because it may have seized up. So, you know, it's, it's not saying that if you don't get a good night's sleep, you'll die tomorrow. It's saying, you know, you need to keep the body in, in, in tip top condition, body and brain in working at its best. I mean, there is a connection, isn't there, between poor sleep and dementia? Well, yeah, the, 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 if, you read the, if you read the newspapers, you'll believe that. Absolutely. Oh. Um, <laughs> We don't know. As I said earlier, deep sleep, uh, the N3 sleep, is involved in processing and laying down new memories. And that's one of the things that we see that is lost in Alzheimer's. And it is thought that some people uh, lose their deep sleep and therefore are more liable to develop Alzheimer's. But we don't know whether that's cause and effect. Some data shows that actually poor sleep might be the first sign of dementia. So it's the other way around. Mm. Um, and we can pick up the poor sleep long be before we could actually pick up the um, you know, cognitive decline that you'd mm. expect in Alzheimer's. So I, I, when, I, when I do my lectures, I, I say, look, there is an association, but there isn't causation. And for me, getting a good night's sleep is not about living longer. It's about living better. Yeah, it's quality. about being better tomorrow. Because the day after, I might get run over by a number 19 bus. 
So, you know, it, it's if, if you get a good night's sleep, tomorrow will be better. Mm. You know, so, so thinking about maybe there is this theoretical risk um, isn't, isn't helpful because then you, I mean, there's a, a doctor in 1916, uh, a guy called James Walsh, who said insomnia is dread. He wrote two papers on this in New York. And one of the biggest thing is the biggest cause of insomnia is that you are told that you'll die or go mad if you have insomnia. So a lot of people are going to bed thinking, oh, I'm not going to get a good night's sleep tonight. And that's a self-fulfilling prophecy. They won't get a good night's sleep. Whereas for me, I get into bed every night thinking, this is it. This is, you know, tonight I'm going to have a great night's sleep. It'll be brilliant. And usually it is. If it's not, then tomorrow night will be fine. Mm, absolutely. And so, you know, one of the questions we've got is what, you know, what goes wrong? So presumably that's what, what goes wrong? I, I, I go to sleep or I've gone to sleep or I haven't got to sleep. What's going wrong? Well, it's, it's actually very simple um, if you think about it. From an evolutionary point of view, it is a very stupid thing to do to be in bed, pretty much unaware of society and what's going on for eight hours. It's a very silly thing to do. So from an evolutionary point of view, we can only sleep if we feel safe and secure. Oh. There's no threat. Now that can be external threat or in an internal threat. So if uh, you know, you are in the wilderness and you hear a wolf, it would be a pretty stupid thing to do to fall asleep. Uh, if you are cold, it's a stupid thing to fall asleep because you're not going to produce heat, therefore you'll die. So those are extremes. But when we're talking about our lives now, when we get into bed, well, what can disturb us? Well, for most people, anxiety, the racing mind. You can't sleep if you don't have a quiet mind. So, so depression, anxiety, stress, worry will stop you from sleeping. If there is something in the body, pain is, a, is an existential idea. Pain is the body's way of telling you there is something wrong. Oh. Um, and, and so pain will wake you up. Having a full bladder will wake you up because you were taught for the first God knows how many years of your life not to wet the bed. So you have a fear. So, so it, it's that internal or external threat, whatever that may be. So, you know, if you have a relaxed body, a quiet mind and a safe and comfortable bedroom, then you'll sleep. So anything that challenges that peace and quiet, so a snoring partner, your bed partner moving, I mean, I've just come back from uh, seeing my partner who lives in Poland and we went down to this lovely hotel in the mountains and the bed was minute and yeah, it was terrible. <laughs> this is just every move, every cough was amplified uh, a million times. So anything that challenges that. So again, it, it's making it, reducing it to the very simplistic level. So this is what, I was, what we talked about at the start, where we're talking about not, you know, not illnesses, and now we're talking about what goes wrong. And it's a very general thing. If it disturbs your mind and body, it will disturb sleep. And as I say, that can be you know, radiotherapy, a tumour, bladder spasticity, whatever, whatever condition. But yeah. it's that thing that disturbs sleep that is the importance, that, 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 that the balance, that homeostasis, that peace of yeah. body and mind. So, I mean, one of the things, you know, the last question we have, you know, that we discussed, we talk about is how to fix it. And I suppose the, the thing to do is also to try to understand what it is that is causing that, that yeah. the lack of calm. Because quite Absolutely. often you don't always recognise it in yourself if you're stressed. Absolutely, and this is this is what I'm what I, what I was saying about the illness. Going to your doctor and saying I've got MS and I can't sleep doesn't tell me anything. Uh. What do you mean by you can't sleep? What do you mean 
what's what's the problem? You've got MS. Okay, let's let's put MS to one side. Let's put cancer, Parkinson's to one side. Why can't you sleep? Well, my mind's racing. Well, that's got nothing to do with your MS or your cancer. That's your mind racing. Everybody has that problem. Everybody has a problem sleeping if there's mind racing. So that's what we need to deal with. We don't need to give you a tablet for that because if it's your mind racing, cognitive behavioral therapy for insomnia, thought blocking, you know, subtracting seven from a thousand sequentially or going through the alphabet, uh, naming a, an animal beginning with each letter of the alphabet. Those are what a psychologist would do to quieten the mind. Have a nice wind down routine, put your cares and worries to one side. Now you might say, but I've, I've got MS, MS, I'm seriously ill. Yeah, I know, but we're talking about your sleep, <laughs> not about your condition. Wow. And this is what um, <coughs> people have, you know, again, <coughs> I've just mentioned sharing a bed with my partner. Um, if you have a condition that causes you to be uncomfortable during the night, have separate beds. Because that way you can toss and turn, you can switch the light on, you can huff and puff without disturbing your partner. But if you're with your partner, you might think, oh my God, I don't want to wake them up. So I, I'll lie here suffering in pain or whatever, so I don't wake my partner up. Uh. Again, changing your bed reduces the anxiety. Oh, what if I have a bad night's sleep last tonight? I'll disturb my partner. Well, you've now got rid of that anxiety because you're in your own bed. You can yeah. do what you like <coughs> without disturbing them or them disturbing you. If you lie there next to somebody snoring, again, it doesn't matter what illness you've got if your partner's snoring like a rhino. Yeah? That's yeah. not to do with your sleep or your illness. It's to do with them. Yeah. Oh, what I like, what I like, is that you you're bringing it down to a very simplistic level, which is actually good. It's trying to get all the other stuff out the way. Yeah, I mean, and, and this is it. You know, scientists like to be important and clever, <laughs> um, and, and now, and this is this is this is the problem. It's like communicating to the patient. And it's that practical, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> the practicality for the patient. Um, so your sleep is part of you, but it is not necessarily part of your condition. So you have to notice where it is within the remit of the doctor and where it is within the remit of what you can do. So, you know, blackout blinds, heavy curtains for the bedroom, very, very simple solution, yeah. will help. Women of a certain age, temperature, yeah. you have to lose one degree of body temperature in order to get a good night's sleep. If you are having hot flushes, that's not going to work. So reducing the bedroom temperature, wearing yeah. natural fibres to wick up Sweat. A lot of people think <coughs> that um, they should, you know, sleep naked if it's hot or if they're hot. But if you do that, <coughs> excuse me, this is not good. Not but good. If they do that, the sweat remains on the skin, which actually shuts down the cooling process. So wearing bamboo or silk or, or wool or, or, or cotton pajamas to wick away the moisture will actually help you moderate your temperature a lot more. Separate beds, as I say, I published the first ever paper about partners in their sleep, showing that much of your sleep disturbance is caused by your bed partner and vice versa. Right. So why do it? What, why sacrifice your sleep? Um, unnecessarily so and so there's all of these things that are simple that will help and once you start addressing your sleep by doing all these other things what's left if there is anything left what's left is the thing that you need to really do something about if you feel what I mean yeah but just going to your doctor and saying I'm not sleeping you know a good doctor will say well have you done this have you done that have you done that have you done that and if you go no well what do you expect uh a good question to ask yourself is how do you sleep when you go on holiday? 
oh, I sleep brilliantly when I'm on holiday. Well, then you don't have a sleep problem. You no. have a life problem. <laughs> you know, because... Okay, well, you're not on holiday permanently. <laughs> well, exactly. But then look at what being on holiday is. Yeah. For you, and how much of that can you... Uh, um, you know, it put into your life. I mean, you know, it's coming up now <coughs> where I will be answering questions on the media about how to sleep in the heat. Mm. Um, in Britain, it never gets that hot at night. Uh, and we spend a lot of money going to Spain, to Portugal, to Egypt, or whatever, to sleep in the heat. And yet the same temperature at home is terrible, but we desperately want to do it when we go overseas. So I just say, have a pina colada. You know, don't see it as, oh my God, it's too hot. Think I would be paying real money for this. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Do you know what I mean? Um, so, so this is it. What is left? If you have dealt with everything that's in your image, and then you go to the doctor and say, yeah, I've done all of these things, but I still can't sleep. Therefore, it's over to you to give me whatever will help me sleep so I can have a good quality of life. Mm. Right. I am going to start now on the questions to try and get through them. And um, Kath, I do like your comments. And also, funny enough, Kath, this is the first question that I've got here. Um, I'm currently taking corticoids, corticosteroids. Is that right? Yep. When is a good time to take them so that they are in my system, kind of like they might be as if I'm creating them myself? I, I mean, that, that would depend on what you're taking and what the doctor has told you to do with regards to taking them. Um, the, it, it, you know, have that conversation with the doctor. The problem with the, that question is that it's based on your medical history, why the doctor is giving you that drug. So have a conversation and say, you know, what are you giving me? Why are you giving it to me? And when should I be taking it for, for it to be working best for me? Mm. Okay. Right. Moving swiftly on, Kathleen asks, um, and I think we've probably answered this, I have a lot of trouble falling asleep. I also wake up several times in the night. Um, and she states her age. I don't know if age plays a, a big part in... Age plays a very big part. As we get older, we need the same amount of sleep, but our sleep becomes lighter and more easily disturbed, and there is less pressure for us to go back to sleep. So when you're 20, you wake up, you go for a pee, you get back into bed, you fall back straight to sleep. Uh. When you're 60, you wake up, you have a pee, you go back to bed, your partner's snoring, you're in pain, you start worrying and you lay there for an hour and a half. So our sleep does change as we get older. What is important is one, what is waking her up. Uh. Um, being woken up repeatedly in the night, there must be a reason, whether external or internal. And then it's about that falling back to sleep. So <clears throat> the, the best technique, if you've been awake for 20 minutes in the middle of the night, and you still haven't fallen back to sleep, get up, go to another room, do something quiet and go back to bed when you feel sleepy again. Because there's no point lying in bed, getting ever more frustrated that you're not sleeping or doing that panic maths, you know, where you go, well, if I don't fall asleep in the next 10 minutes and I won't get enough sleep and then I won't yeah. be able to, and, and, oh my God, it's still haven't fallen asleep. So get up, go somewhere else, do something else uh, and go back to bed when you're sleepy. Or if you can't, switch the light on. And again, this is going back to what I was talking about sleeping separately. Uh, if you've got something next to you, it may be difficult to switch the light on and read. But if you're on your own, then switching the light on and reading uh, is fine. And, that, and that's what I do. I, I will always switch. You know, if I've, if I've tossed and turned, I think, oh, and this is a lost cause, I'll switch the light on. Read. Sometimes I read a page. Sometimes I read the entire book. But I don't see that as a problem because I'm doing something I want rather than, I say, lying in bed getting really, really frustrated. So um, okay. break the cycle of worry or anxiety about sleep. Um, this one, is, in fact, is just so spot on what we've been talking about is from Susan. And I, to be honest, think we've answered it, but it just shows it's an obvious uh, a, a problem that people have. I'm on a high dose of antidepressants, also just prescribed as a sedative to help me sleep. Problem is I'm on other long-term meds and constantly dysfunctional if I keep taking the full dose. So I have to keep skipping part of the dose to get to appointments. So I think that's what you're saying is that all, you know, when you're taking a lot of medication, 
it's probably time to go and get someone to look at it from a sleep perspective. Yeah, and, and you know, I, I don't know which antidepressant she's taking, but if she's on a high dose of an antidepressant, there are very few of them at a high dose that would have a beneficial effect on the sleep. Uh -huh. So um, it may be that that high dose antidepressant isn't the right drug. She may need an antidepressant, but there are maybe better antidepressants and she may then need something to help her sleep as well. But again, it's going to the doctor and saying this mix, this cocktail of drugs that I'm being prescribed isn't working for me. And it's nothing to do with the sleep. She's not talking about her sleep. She's talking about how it's not allowing her to, you know, be in the day, the person she would like to be. So that's what you need to say to the doctor. This isn't helping me. What can we do about it? And, you know, say there are these specialist pharmacists who do medicines reviews in this regard. Jenny, um, now she is a lady that has fibromyalgia, but she also has... Um, ME, asthma and nerve pain and so she's she has a problem she can fall asleep for four hours but she gets tired during the day where she dozes off she's done all the obvious things like comfortable mattress and topper um, and things for reflux and she said is there anything else she she could do uh, well fibromyalgia as I mentioned earlier there has in, in many patients and it would sound like it in this thing um, we have this deep sleep this N3 sleep which is from a technical point of view known as delta waves. And we also have alpha waves, which is the waveform you get in the brain when you're awake with your eyes closed. So usually to have sleep, the alpha wave disappears. And then when we go into our deep sleep, we have the delta wave. But in many fibromyalgia patients, they have something called alpha delta sleep. So what they, part of the brain is deeply asleep, but other parts of the brain are awake. And this means that sleep is unrefreshing because that deep sleep is the bit that one makes you think like you've had a good night's sleep and two is the bit that keeps you awake during the day. So as I mentioned earlier, a fibromyalgia patient will sleep for eight hours, maybe, uh, but wake up and you think, well, you've slept for eight hours. That's great. But they haven't got the benefit of that deep sleep. Now, in America, there is a medication that is improves deep sleep selectively and is licensed for fibromyalgia that drug is not available in the uk uh, or in europe uh, because when uh, the company who make it bought it to the european medicines agency they said we don't believe that fibromyalgia exists therefore you don't need a drug for fibromyalgia yeah. go away and prove fibromyalgia exists and the drug company said no way not interested but that is the only medication that can benefit patients with fibromyalgia uh, to get more effective sleep and therefore maybe reduce the, the daytime sedation. And it's, it's not cool. on formerly here, presumably. It's not, I mean, it is available in the UK for other conditions. Right, okay. It's available for, uh, for GAD, general anxiety disorder, neuropathic pain and epilepsy. And it's made by Pfizer, so anybody with the internet will be able to find out which drug I'm talking about. Yeah. Um, but as I say, it is not on, it's not licensed for fibromyalgia, so it's worth talking to your doctor about possible drugs. But again, doing anything you can yourself do to improve your sleep. Don't be resigned to the fact of, I have this condition, therefore all yeah. is lost do the beneficial things we've talked about and see if they make a difference, which is livable with, um, or whether you do need to go further with your GP um, and, and say, you know, you need to sort this out. And there's a nice comment um, that probably everybody might have seen from Flory saying that she's tried a lot of your recommendations and that they, and they have made a huge difference. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> I'm not saying that you're telling us stuff that wouldn't, but it's nice. No, it, you know. the thing is, it's, it's mostly common sense. Um, and we all have this innate, uh, we have an innate ability to sleep. We've been doing it for 450 million years. We, we should uh. be rather good at it by now. And so <laughs> the advice isn't complex. And going back to what I was saying, people want to make things complex, whereas with sleep, it's not. 
you know, if you ask somebody who sleeps well, what do you do to help you sleep? They'll look at you like you're an idiot. Mm. I lie down and I close my eyes. How is that difficult? <laughs> you're not you're not going to be falling asleep if you're there on your phone. No, you can't sleep. <laughs> so, so, so you don't need me to tell you don't use your phone. No. And, anyway. and what it's become so complex. Yeah. And because you can make money selling this or that supplement or this or that pillow, but it's not have a quiet mind, a relaxed body in a comfortable bedroom, you will sleep, all things being equal. Mm. So um, here's, I mean, lots of these questions I am going to skip because hopefully m most people who ask questions will know that we have answered a lot of them now. Um, one lady called Vanessa says that um, she's had some major surgery and, you know, is there any advice about, she has to sit upright in bed so that she can drain her neck but she still and still need to support neck and get some sleep. Is I mean, is there anything that you would say about is anything found out being in certain positions help or is it for individually? It's individual and and you know um, you know if, if you want to keep the head elevated or you need to keep the head elevated and of course you could invest in a uh, you know mechanical adjustable bed which will cost you a fortune or you could stick a couple of planks of four by two. Uh, under under your uh, under your bed and a bolster pillow remember i mean you know i'm, I'm 57 so i can remember bolster pillow yeah. and you know, we used to have bolsters. i mean the tudors you know when you go to a tudor house and you'll see these short beds and people say all oh, that's because they were poor and they were all much shorter it wasn't it was because lying down was considered to be the position of death so tudors yeah. actually slept with a bolster pillow uh, and and uh, a, a pillow, uh, and, and and that's what they had. So that's perfectly possible. So again, it's about finding something that's comfortable for you to do. Uh -huh. um, you know, the neck pillows that you can buy at the airport to, to, for when you when you're sleeping on the on the aircraft. I mean, you know, many Buddhist monks actually sleep sitting up. It, uh, they they don't lie down. I mean, lie down, lying down is is the ultimate, but it doesn't have to be. So just look at what you know what you need to do. But you certainly don't have to invest you know a huge mm. fortune in something that you know will do what you want and is comfortable. Um, what else is? What are the best non-description um alter, like alternative medicine? Is there anything like that that you would? suggest that works anything and everything uh, it, it is what works for you uh you know people say oh, lavender works well yes yeah, scientifically it does i hate the smell of lavender i hate the taste of chamomile tea so they're not going to help me sleep so it's finding out what works for you i mean the, the old adage one man's relaxation is another man's torture so for some people listening to Mozart, other people listening to Pink Floyd. Um, so if you take something and it helps, fine. If you take something and it doesn't help, then don't be surprised, <laughs> you, you know. Um, so if you like taking valerian and you sleep well every night, there's absolutely no reason to stop taking valerian. But if you take valerian for a couple of weeks and you think this is doing nothing for me, then look for something else. But you've got to give it about two weeks. Two, okay. To, to, to know. You can't just take you know, something one night and go, well, that didn't work for me. You've got to give it a good, a good try. But as I say, some things will work for you. Maybe other things won't. But as I say, there's no magic uh, way to sleep that will work for everybody. Mm. And this is a good question. Should people with fatigue conditions sleep in the day if they need to, whether or not they set well in the night? Uh, that, that's a, a bit of a thorny issue. I mean, oh, is it? If you're eight, well, if you're an eight hour a night person and you sleep for two hours during the day, you're only going to need six hours sleep at night. Uh. Is that a problem? Now, if it's not and it works for you, then sleep is sleep is sleep. The body would prefer to get sleep at night, but if you don't get your full quota of sleep at night and you can get it during the day, then get it during the day. 
Um, it, it doesn't matter. I say, ideally, it should be one block at night. But if that's not possible, any sleep is good sleep. Um, so it, it, what, what, I mean, I get asked, you know, is it OK to have a nap in the afternoon? Yes, as long as you're not a school bus driver. You know, it, it, it is if it works for you. But I say, if you have a two hour nap in the afternoon and wake up at four o'clock in the morning going, oh, woe is me, it's dark, it's cold and I'm scared then perhaps you should be trying to sleep at night, not during the day, but whatever, whatever works for you, sleep um, is good. So, I mean, do you think if you, it's, it is detrimental to sleep, you're better just to do your sleep at night time? That's, that's what we've evolved to do. Um, yeah, uh, we sleep at night because our nocturnal vision is rubbish and we can't do anything else. Uh, um, but we do have the post-lunch dip um and that doesn't need food that happens between two and four o'clock in the afternoon um when as noel coward would say mad dogs and englishmen go out in the midday sun it's too hot to chase anything for dinner so it's far better to sit under a tree and and conserve resources and if you're doing that you might as well sleep so we're all going to think right that's it you know could have a nap now um, and if you don't have anything on this afternoon and you want to have a nap, have a nap. But as I say, it could affect the amount of sleep you have at night, uh. but whether that's important or not. If you wake up at seven, uh, six o'clock in the morning and think, what a beautiful morning, I'm going to learn Spanish, take the dog for the walk and lick blankets for Ukraine, then do it. But if you uh. wake up and think, oh my God, what am I going to do? Then, then, then don't do it. But as I say, if you have the opportunity and you feel the need to do it, then, then have a nap if it is not explicitly disturbing your nighttime sleep. Mm. Um, well, we've very sadly run out of time and I haven't got through lots of your questions, so I'm really sorry, but I honestly think that a lot of it you have, Neil, because of all over the place you've gone with different things, but. It's more about, I think, that your approach is so refreshing with sleep, is to condense it down into something simple. Yeah, it is. And, and that's, we've made it complex. Um, and as I say, a quiet mind, a relaxed body, and a comfortable bedroom, you will sleep, all things being uh, If you've got those and you still can't sleep, see your doctor, stamp your feet, and get looked after properly and say it's your health not their health don't give a monkeys what your doctor's opinion is about the pros and cons it's what works for you if you found a medication that helps you sleep demand that medication seven days a week 365 days a year they have no right to deny you that medication and i think the other thing that um I think is really important is is that positivity if you think you know if you think you're going to go to bed you go with the right frame i am going to have a good night's sleep you are far more likely than if you're telling yourself you're not going to be able to sleep yeah i mean people uh, you know I, I come across people who are scared to go to sleep that's of course you'll never get a good night's sleep if you're scared of going to sleep if you um, worry about going to sleep if you think you're going to have a bad night's sleep you know, if you go to bed going, I'm not going to get to sleep. There's no way I'm going to sleep now. It's just not going to happen. I'm not going to sleep. I'm going to lie here. That's what you're doing. Yeah. You, you, you've talked yourself into it. Yeah. And, and, that, and that's a shame. Yeah. And I know we've laughed about it, but it's, it's you know, sleep is obviously is a, is a major issue and problem for people. And it is a very serious conversation. It is. And as I say, everything, you know, even though, I mean, sleep is not going to cure you of your long term condition. Uh, wish it would, but it isn't. Yeah. But it's going to make it easier to cope with it and it will make life better. That's yeah. not saying life will be good, but it is saying life will be better. And that surely is something that we all want. However, or whatever condition we're in, we would like life just to be a little bit better. And that's yeah. what sleep can do for you. And as yeah. I say, unfortunately, it's not a cure, but it is a better life if you get better sleep. Well, on that note, on that positive note, I'd like to wish you 
And what do I want to wish you? Well, I would like to thank you very much. <laughs> and wish everybody a good night's sleep tonight. So thank you very much, Neil. It's really it's kind been of a great you. pleasure. Thank you. Cheers then. Bye. Bye, Bye. everyone.